That's what we want to look at for a few minutes tonight. And of course, as we think about that, the first thought that might come to mind is that many people do not do what is right. And that takes us to Amos chapter 3. Notice what is said here. When we look at Amos the prophet, we're looking at a period of time in Israel's history when the prophet is sent by God, Amos is sent by God to address the rebellious people of Israel. They are rebelling against their God. And here's the message that is given. Amos chapter 3 and verse 10. For they do not know to do right, says the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. Now to do right is to follow after that which is true. To practice what is approved by God. That is to do right. The Israelites here in the days of Amos, they didn't do what was right, and they didn't even know to do right, because they weren't interested in following after what was true and doing what was proper. They weren't interested in obeying God's word. They didn't even know to do right at this point. In the same manner, many people today have very little interest in learning what is right and putting forth the effort to actually do what is right. What we need to know about that is, of course, that God's Word determines what is right. In Judges chapter 21, in verse 25, during the days of the judges of Israel, it was said that in those days there was no king in Israel. Now notice this. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now let me tell you, there's a world of difference between doing what is right in your own eyes, in the eyes of man, and doing what is right in the eyes of God. The only way that we can know for certain whether our attitudes and our actions and our conduct are right is to measure ourselves by the perfect standard of God's Word. That's the only way we really know what is right. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, the inspired wise man, notice this, he says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. I might think it's right, it might feel right, it might seem right, that doesn't mean that it is right. It could be the way of death. Psalm 19, in verses 7 through 9, describes for us our perfect standard. How God's word is our perfect standard. The law of the Lord, verse 7 begins, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. There is our standard. God's word tells us what is right because it is right. In John chapter 8, as we come to the New Testament, notice what Jesus said on this occasion. In John chapter 8 and verses 31 and 32, we read, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now man has his opinions as to what is right for him to do. Everyone has opinions. Everyone you talk to will give you an opinion about what is right and what is wrong, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, how you should live your life. We all have our opinions. Man has lots of opinions, but God's word is the standard. God's word is the truth. God's Word tells us what is really right. 
Uh, what I want to say to you today is that if you are a Christian, then you have done what is right. Do you ever feel like you can't do anything right? Do you ever have one of those days? Maybe it lasts longer than a day, right? You wake up in the morning, pour yourself a glass of water, and then you drop it on the floor, and it breaks and goes everywhere. And then you, you go out to the driveway, and your neighbor says, how are you? And you say, not much. That's not how that's supposed to go, right, Bill? And then you get in your car, right, to back out of the driveway, and then of course, you forget that the garbage cans are out there, and you plow right over those. And then you drive on your way, and you go to work, and you get to work, and then you realize it was your day off. Can't do anything. You ever have days like that? Just everything, it feels like you just can't do anything right. Everything's just wrong. It just turns out wrong. I think most of us can identify with that feeling, at least from time to time. But if you are a Christian, according to the Bible's definition of a Christian, then you have done what is right. Where it matters most, where it really counts, you have done what is right. Now, there may be hundreds of other things in our lives that we can't control, all kinds of things that don't go our way, but isn't it a comfort to know that if you are a faithful Christian, the truth of the matter is that when it comes down to what is most important, you've gotten it right. You've gotten it right. So, what have you done right? Sometimes we need to stop and think about that. We need to realize just what it is that we have done that is right. And so if you're a Christian tonight, I want us to think about what we have done right. If you're not a Christian tonight or not yet, if you have not yet been baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, I want you to think about this too. Tonight may be the night that you need to make a decision about that. And we hope that you will. Think about these things. What have you done right as a Christian? First thing is that you have believed in the right Lord. There are many Lords to whom people submit in their lives. Now, many people submit to the false gods of Islam or Hinduism, or Buddhism, or various other pagan religions that are out there, and there are people that submit to all these different lords and all these different gods. Somebody says, well, wait a second, you mentioned Islam. I, I mean, I was told that Allah is just another name for God. I mean, it's just they tell us it's just all the same God. Well, no, any Muslim will tell you that Allah does not have a son. Jesus is the son of God. Allah is not the God we worship, not the same as the Father of whom we read in Scripture. That's a false God. All of these are false gods that are out there. People submit themselves to false lords and false gods. And in our present culture, even beyond that, many people set up money and possessions and material things or power or fame as the idols before whose altar they will bow. You see, the Lord, your Lord, is the one in whom you place your trust, the one whom you obey. That's your Lord, whether people realize it or not. In Romans 6 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Whatever you submit to, that's your master. That's your master. I'm reading from the New King James Version here. You may have slightly different wording, but that's what I've got on the screen here, the New King James Version. Now, even those who disavow any belief in God, even those who reject any belief in God, even those who worship at the altars of evolutionism or humanism, they have a Lord that they seek to serve. It may be self. 
It may be man who has made the measure of all things and man's intellect that is held up as the master of all things. But there is still a Lord. There still is a Lord people are submitting themselves to. Whatever one's idols may be, the prophet Isaiah well sums up the reality of the situation in Isaiah chapter 41 in verse 24. He says of these idols, Indeed, you are nothing, and your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. That's the reality of the situation. But if you are a Christian, then you have believed in the right Lord. Not a false God, not a false Lord, not one of these idols, not a false Lord that can't do anything or say anything or accomplish anything for anyone, but the right Lord. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Notice what the Apostle Paul says here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, in verses 4 through 6, he rightly points out, that in spite of man's tendency to submit to various gods and lords, the truth of the matter is that there is only one right one. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Notice verses 4 and 5. Therefore concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is what? Is nothing in the world. That there is no other God but one, for even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, now notice verse 6, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all, through whom are all things and through whom we live. We don't have options. There's not an equality of all these different beliefs and all these different lords and all of these different gods out there. There's only one right one. And as the Son of God walked this earth, he affirmed his place as the only right Lord for men. In John 8 and verse 24, Jesus said, Therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he... You will die in your sins. There's no other way. There's no other option. He is the only right Lord. In John chapter 14, do you remember what he said there? John 14 and verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other Lord. There is no other way. He is the only way. In Matthew chapter 11, in verses 28 through 30. Here Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the real Lord inviting anyone who will come to him to come and receive salvation and rest and eternal life. He can offer that. He alone. Now if you are a Christian, you need to take heart in the understanding that if all the different lords out there in whom you could have chosen to believe and place your trust in and follow, you have believed in the right Lord. If you're a Christian, you've gotten that right. Now, what else have you done, Mike? Well, if you're a Christian, you have obeyed the right plan of salvation. There are a lot of different plans people follow. You now, man is constantly seeking some kind of fulfillment, some kind of satisfaction to fill the void that exists in life. Even people who, who claim that they're not religious or that they're atheistic, don't believe in God, they recognize still they've got a void they're trying to fill. And that's a fact. In Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 20, we read, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Man is always looking for something, always longing for something, always wanting to fill that void. People try to find salvation and 
in what? In drugs and alcohol, right? Trying to fill up that emptiness with sexual immorality. Try to fill it up with greed and materialism, more material things, and a host of other things, none of which will bring any lasting fulfillment or lasting contentment. Now, many other people, understanding their, that their need is actually a spiritual need and a need for a relationship with God, they will go in search of fulfilling that need only to come up short because they've settled for the wrong message and have followed the wrong plan. There are those that will look to the Pope to absolve them of their sins. And there are those that will, will say a sinner's prayer which they think will bring about salvation for them. Or there are those that succumb to the notion that all you have to do is just believe in Jesus and be saved by faith alone. Well, the Apostle Paul warned of those who would present a twisted plan of salvation, one that would not save at all. In Galatians chapter 1, notice verses 6 through 9. To the churches of Galatia, Paul writes here, beginning in Galatians 1 and verse 6, he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. There's only one right plan. Man comes along and changes it, twists it, perverts it. That won't save. All that does is cause one to be accursed, doomed to destruction. The simple truth of the matter is that most people who claim to be Christians have never done what the Bible actually says you must do in order to become a Christian. But if you're a Christian, you've done what is right. You follow the right plan. You have obeyed the right plan of salvation. The Lord and his apostles delivered the gospel plan with which sinners must comply in order to be saved. By the grace of God, that means we didn't deserve this. That's God giving us what we don't deserve. God stepped in, in spite of our sins, to make it possible for us to just obey some simple terms and receive salvation. In Mark 16, after the resurrection of Jesus, in verses 15 and 16, we read that he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Very simple terms. Believe and be baptized into Christ. That's how you can be saved. In Acts chapter 2, we read about the apostles delivering that message on the day of Pentecost, shortly thereafter. And as the apostle Peter preached about the death, burial, and resurrection there, in verse 37, the Bible says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? See, there's the question. What's the plan? How do we fix this? How do we have a relationship with God? How do we get rid of our sins? There's the question. And the apostles answered that question. Peter said to them in verse 38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. That's how you can be saved. That's how you can have your sins taken away. In Romans chapter 10, in verses 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul writes that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And as we put all of this together, we understand that here are the terms for salvation. There's no other way to become a Christian besides this. 
believing in the resurrected Lord, confessing that belief with the mouth, repenting of your sins, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. That's what the Apostle Paul himself was instructed to do when he was converted to Christ. The preacher Ananias came to him in Acts 22 and verse 16 as it's recounted there. And he said to him, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's how to become a Christian. That's how to become a Christian. And if you are a Christian, by the Bible's definition, then you need to take heart in the understanding that in spite of all the various plans out there that men have devised, you have obeyed the right plan in order to receive salvation. If you've done that, you have obeyed the right plan. That's what you've gotten right. What else have you gotten right? Now, another thing to think about is that you've been added to the right church. And again, there are many different kinds of churches out there today. For many centuries, it's been the case that those who claim to follow Jesus have divided themselves up into various religious organizations. And these various religious organizations teach and practice things that contradict what the Bible says. And not only that, but they teach and practice things that contradict one another. Even though the Lord demands unity of his followers. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 4 through 6, Paul put it this way. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. We are to come together on the oneness of God's plan. There are not options. There are not two or three lords and five or six faiths and several different baptisms. One, 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 one is what we see all through here. We have to come together on that and unite on that. And yet man continues to act as though the options are just unlimited. There are thousands of different denominations in existence, new ones popping up all the time, and you have the various community churches, and you have the, the so-called non-denominational churches that become kind of like a miniature denomination unto themselves. All these different churches across the landscape. And in this sea of religious confusion, man's plea is to do what? You just join the church of your choice. That's considered the solution to all of that. But let me tell you something. If you are a Christian... Again, by the Bible's definition of that term, if you are a Christian, you have been added to the right church. In Colossians chapter 1, notice what Paul says here. In spite of what may be popular today, and what may, may be acceptable, and what may be promoted today, the Bible still assures us that Jesus is, is the head of the church. One church. He is the Savior of one body. In Colossians 1 and verse 18, Paul, speaking of Jesus, says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. You see the singular usage here? Body, not bodies. Church, not churches. We're talking about that one body that we read about a moment ago in Ephesians chapter 4. One body of saved people that belongs to the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 23, Paul puts it this way. He says, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. One body. That's what he's the savior of. <clears throat> now, if you have obeyed the gospel, as we talked about a few minutes ago, you've been saved. And if that is the case, then you have been added to the Lord's church 
by the Lord himself. Now we know that because that's the way it's laid out for us, again, going to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we read a few moments ago how Peter told the people they needed to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. Verse 41 says that those who glad to receive his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Added to who? Added to what? Well, we skip down to verse 47, and we read out that they were praising God and having favor with all the people. Now notice, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That's how you become part of the Lord's body. You obey the gospel, you meet his terms for salvation, he makes you one of his people. No man controls that. No man determines that. No group, no organization determines that. The Lord makes you part of his church. Now, of course, moving beyond that, we recognize that the Bible does talk about local churches, right? We read about the church at Corinth, the church of Ephesus. We read about the church at Philippi, the church at Jerusalem, the church at Antioch. Those are local groups of people who have already been added to the Lord's body, meeting and assembling and worshiping in different places throughout the world. We need to do that. We need to make sure that we follow the Lord's pattern in that. But the point that I'm trying to make is that if you are a Christian, you need to take heart in understanding that in spite of all these different religious groups that exist today that men have created, in spite of all the confusion and all the division that is out there, you have been added to the right church, the one that belongs to Jesus Christ. That's what you've been added to if you have done what the Bible says you need to do to be saved. What else have you done right as a Christian? Well, something else to consider is that you've chosen to live the right kind of life. There are a lot of different ways people choose to live. Without a doubt, one of the most popular ways of approaching life is not to follow the will of God, but instead to do whatever you feel like doing at the time. That's the most popular way to live your life. That's the way many of our neighbors and friends and even relatives are living their lives. Just do whatever you feel like, when you feel like. The prophet Jeremiah wrote of those who approach life in that kind of way. In Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 12. He said, they said, that is hopeless. That is following God's way. That is hopeless. So we will walk according to our own plans, and we will everyone obey the dictates of his evil heart. We're going to do whatever we feel like doing. That's a popular way to live life. We live in a culture in which we have been taught that we are nothing more than highly evolved animals, and that we have arrived here just by random chance, and survival is for the fittest, and it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. That's what we've been taught in our culture. And what a surprise that many people choose to live their lives acting out exactly what they've been taught by our culture. Living and acting like animals devouring each other, stepping all over each other, taking what they want from one another. See, that's what happens when you're taught that you're just an animal, you tend to act like one. The Apostle Peter spoke of that kind of approach. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3, he said, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days doing what? Walking according to their own lusts. You know what that means? That means that you go through your life and you do whatever you feel like doing. 
to whomever you feel like doing it or with whom you feel like doing it. You just do whatever makes you feel happy and feel good at the time. That's the world in which we live. That's the way people are living. But if you're a Christian, a faithful child of God, you're not living like that. You've chosen to live the right kind of life, the best kind of life. In Matthew chapter 22, notice what Jesus says here. Jesus taught that the highest and the best kind of life that anyone may live is a life that shows the proper attitude of respect toward God and the proper attitude toward one's fellow man. Matthew 22, there was one here who questioned Jesus about the great commandment in the law. His response is recorded here in verses 37 through 39. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Treat others the way you want to be treated, right? That's what he said in Luke chapter 6 and verse 31. Just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. And rather than behaving like a bunch of greedy, brutal animals acting on urges and impulses, we're to treat others the way we would want to be treated ourselves. That's the highest way to live. That's the best way to live. That is the right way to live. Instead of walking according to our own fleshly lust, we're supposed to be bringing forth and producing in our lives what the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what is produced in the life of a faithful Christian. When you follow the Spirit's message, what we have here in the Word of God, this is what comes out in our behavior, in our attitudes, in our actions, in our lives, in our interactions with others. That is the opposite of the way people generally behave in our world. Self-control Kindness, long-suffering, patience, all of these things that are supposed to be the qualities of a Christian, these are very different from the way people generally conduct themselves. If you're a Christian, you need to take heart in understanding that in spite of the way everybody else is doing it, in spite, in spite of the way everybody else has chosen to live, you have chosen to live the right kind of life, the best kind of life, the highest and best life that you can live. And then also, if you are a child of God, you think about what you've done right, you have, you have set your mind on the right goal. There are a lot of different goals people strive toward and look forward to. For so many in our world today, the ultimate goal is to get rich, you know, buy that dream house or that dream car or, or have, you know, a boat or whatever it is, a cottage, whatever it is that your heart desires, you know, make enough money, get what you want, whatever other earthly thing you've got your, your mind set on that you so desperately desire, that's the goal for so many people. And, and as their number one goal, many people take aim at things like, you know, accumulating all the wealth that you can, you know, retire early, become famous, fulfill all your desires for worldly pleasure. All the while, the advice of the scriptures on the matter is pushed aside and ignored while these material and physical goals are pursued with great passion and ambition and devotion. But what does the Bible say? 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. 
Starting here in verse 9, Paul says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That's the end of all that. I look around and say, all these people that are rich and famous and celebrities, wow, they, they've got it made. They've got everything they can want. You know, they've got the private jet and they've got the entourage and they've got the fancy wardrobe and the, and the beach house. And it ends up in sorrow. And it ends up in regret. And it ends up with the loss of one's soul for eternity. You see, if you're a Christian, if you're a faithful child of God, those things are not your goal. If you're a Christian, you have set your mind on the right goal. Now, while the world is out pursuing all those things that don't last or that are just going to be burned up in the end anyway, the faithful Christian is focused on things above. In Colossians chapter 3, in the first four verses of Colossians chapter 3, Paul says, writing to Christians, If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Set your mind on things above. Don't be like everybody else. Don't focus just on the here and now and on the accumulating of earthly things. What did Jesus say about our treasure? Matthew chapter 6, picking up in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our focus is to be on the permanent, not the temporary. The permanent reward in heaven, not on the things here below, but on that which is everlasting. That's where our heart's desire is supposed to be. For the faithful Christian, that hope of heaven outweighs and overshadows anything and everything in this temporary world and what it has to offer. That overshadows everything else. If you are a faithful Christian, you need to take heart in the understanding even though you may have your sights set on a completely different goal from those in the world around you, the reality of the situation is that you have decided to set your mind on the right goal, a real goal, the only goal that is really worth having in the end, a home with God in heaven. As we think about all this tonight, and I appreciate the way that you followed along and listened attentively, there may be a lot of things that are wrong in our world today. There may be a lot of times when we feel like we just can't get it right and can't really do anything wrong. But if you are a faithful child of God, you need to know that you have already gotten the most important things right. No matter what else happens, no matter what might lie ahead, what may happen in the future, isn't it encouraging to know that even in the midst of all the madness that we face from day to day, our loving God has made it abundantly possible for each and every one of us get it right. We can get it right. If you haven't become a Christian, again, most of what we've talked about tonight applies to those who have already done that. They have already obeyed the gospel and are living lives of faithfulness to the Lord. That's the way that we've approached things tonight. But if you haven't 
become a Christian. You haven't gotten it right. Not yet. And we want to encourage you tonight to get it right. It's within the reach of every one of us. As we talked about already, you can do what was right, what is right tonight. You can come confessing your faith in Jesus. You can turn from your sins. And you can be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. You can get it right tonight. All your past sins will be gone. You can start over with your focus on eternal life with God in heaven. Living your life, living the right kind of life. Living for the Lord from this day forward. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to thee.